Hey, Donnie, if you start to hear a little warbling, you want to just move that fan just a little, okay? Otherwise, it doesn't benefit you. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, did you hear about the pastor who was voted the most humble pastor in America? His own congregation supposedly gave him a medal that said, the most humble pastor in America. So one day the pastor wore this pin into the pulpit, and the congregation proceeded to take the pin away from him. <laughs> you know, it's like the man who wrote the book, How I Obtained Great Humility, which was subtitled, Why I'm, Why I'm Now Proud to Share the Secret with You. You know, in this series on Be Humble or Be Humbled, we've studied verse after verse, and we've observed illustration after illustration that has underscored the truth of James chapter 4 and verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now notice the, con the contrast between the proud and the humble. Notice on one hand, God resists. On the other hand, he gives grace. In fact, the word gives grace, that phrase is found two times in this verse. This is what God wants. He wants to give you his grace. He wants to give you his undeserved, unmerited blessings. And you see the word give is didomai. It means to give by way of a needed provision. And these are facts that we are to believe. And that is what you and I need to grasp from our study today. The provision for the humble centered around the grace of God. How can we be proud or act in pride when we are oriented to the grace of God? When we realize that all that we are and all that we have is because of Jesus Christ and his grace. How can we have some claim to fame spiritually? How can we boast as if we did not receive it as a gift? And that's why we've seen from our previous studies that humility requires that we gain a growing and high perspective on God, such as his greatness. And remember, we talked about the greatness of God by way of his attributes. And then last time we looked at his grace and his loyal love and what a combination this provides. And you see, God is great and God is gracious whether we realize it or not, but as we orient to who he is, and we orient to his word, we understand more and more how great he is, and in contrast, how insignificant, how undeserving we are of the blessings that he has provided for us through Jesus Christ. But today what we want to grasp is that humility requires a growing, it should say, orientation to God's grace, starting with salvation starting with salvation and as you know that's the starting point there may be a needed humbling before your salvation brought on by difficult circumstances or a personal rebuke of some kind or perhaps realizing from the word of God that you are a hopeless helpless hellbound sinner before a thrice holy God but it's only when you are saved that you can personally confess amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And so this morning, let's unpack three specific verses from Ephesians chapter 2. Three verses that are like a multifaceted diamond shining brightly next to a black velvet cloth. Three verses that are pregnant with meaning. Three verses that capture the brilliance of God's grace as it relates to our salvation. Three verses that every believer should have memorized and be established in. Three verses that will open your eyes to the wonderful grace of Jesus. What are these three verses? Ephesians chapter 2 we begin in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. 
And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Those are the three verses. Now remember, every word of God is pure, and all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and that's why we're going to be examining very closely the words of these verses. You see, the first thing that we are to note as we study verse 8 is the basis for salvation is God's grace. The basis for salvation is God's grace. On what basis does God save a lost sinner? Is it due to man's goodness, man's efforts, man's righteousness, man's rituals, or man's works? No, it's all by his grace. For by grace you have been saved. And again, that word grace is our word charis. It speaks not only of undeserved favor and kindness, but it actually speaks of God blessing those who deserve the very opposite. And by the way, this message of grace is what distinguishes true Christianity from all the religions of the world. You can imagine, again, a basket of oranges, as it were. And let this be all the religions of the world. And in doing so, you've got Hinduism, you've got Buddhism, you've got Islam, you've got uh, Roman Catholicism, you've got Protestantism, and even much of evangelicalism. Or you could even have the, the cults and whatever. You know, a lot of them look different. It's packaged a little different. But when it's all said and done, so often what's being taught is the message of works. That you must earn your salvation. And even when they say it's by grace, so often they tell you a work to do yet. And you see, while they look differently at the end of the day, they're very much alike. If you believe in God, however he's prescribed, and you do the required works, you will then maybe go to heaven, maybe have eternal life, maybe see the afterlife, maybe go to nirvana. You may fill in the blank. But it's always rooted in works. And you see, true biblical Christianity is a message of grace. A message in which God has provided for us outside of us and in spite of us his wonderful spiritual blessings. And he offers to them to us as a gift received through simple faith in Jesus Christ. So the basis for salvation is God's grace. But who are the recipients of this undeserved blessing or this grace? Well, we see also in verse 8, the recipients are you. For by grace, you have been saved. And the word you here in the Greek is plural. Plural. Salvation is not only only for a unique class of people. Salvation is not only for a unique race of people or a unique gender of people or a unique group of people. You see, God is not willing any should perish, 2 Peter 3, 9. He wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2, 4. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16. And salvation is needed by all, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's offered to all because Jesus Christ died for all. Thus you and I are in need of salvation, yet you are not beyond the reach of God's saving grace. He wants to save you. But as we think of the you, look earlier in chapter 2 there, beginning in verse 1, of how mankind is described before salvation. What was true of them and is also true of us. Verse 1, And you he made alive who were, number one, dead in trespasses and sins. Now the word dead is talking about spiritually dead. Separated from God relationally. And that is why we need to be born again. You know, sometimes when people use the term total depravity, 
I fully agree, but it depends on how you define that. A proper view of total depravity recognizes man is born separated from God. Man is a slave of sin. Man is unable to contribute to his salvation. Man is unable to save himself. He's been corrupted. Agreed. But when total depravity is taken to the point that man can't even believe the gospel, it creates all kinds of biblical problems. You see, they were dead, but they're going to end up believing. They were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked previously according to the course of this world. Before you were saved, you were enslaved to the course of this world. According to the prince and the power of the air, that's Satan. Before you were saved, you were enslaved to Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also you once conducted yourself in the lusts of the flesh. You were a slave to your sin nature, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature what? Children of wrath, just as the others. Not children of God, but children of wrath. By nature and birth and choice, that's you, and that's me. And that's everyone who's been born into the human race. And it's not a pretty picture. If you want to truly understand mankind, you'll never find a true and accurate diagnosis from anthropology or from sociology or from psychology. But you will from the Word of God, for the Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divine of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. <coughs> But if those verses here didn't paint us sufficiently, sufficiently as hopeless and helpless and hell-bound sinners, look now at verse 11. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time, before you were saved, you were number one or number seven in the description without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers of the covenants of Christ, you were having no hope, and you were without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You were without Christ, the only Savior. You were without hope, no real future to be confident about. You were without God, though you may have religion and even believe in God. You did not have a relationship with Him. And you were far off, separated from God. What a description of the lost. What a description of you and me before salvation. And dear friends, this is bad news for those without Christ. A tenfold description from God himself that should cause every person to have an acute sense of guilt and their great need of salvation, their great need of God's grace, their great need of Jesus Christ. But notice the hope that's penetrated here. But you who are far have been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ. Because of the work of Christ. Because of his sacrifice for your sins on that cross. Why? Because God wants to save you from a hell you deserve to a heaven you don't. God wants a right relationship with you which will last forever. God wants you to become spiritually alive. But why? What would motivate him to desire and provide for that? Certainly, it was not due to human merit. It was not due to human attraction. So what is it? Go back with me to verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You see, the divine motives of salvation involve God's rich mercy and his great love. And don't you love those first two words? But God. Two of the greatest words in the Bible, friends. You were spiritually dead, but God. You were enslaved to the world, 
but God. You were enslaved to Satan, but God. You were enslaved to the flesh, but God. You were a child of wrath, but God, who is rich in mercy. Just not a little bit of mercy, but rich in mercy because of his great love, not a little bit of love, but great love with which he loved us. And again, the word love here is agape, that mental attitude that motivates God to want to do what's best for another in light of eternity, no matter what it costs him. Those are the divine motives behind salvation. But who are the objects of God's love? Who exactly does God love? Well, generally, we know God so loved the world. And in doing so, that encompassed these Ephesians as well, so that we read in verse 4, oops, got ahead of myself for a minute. As we think of that great love, let me recognize the song, How Deep the Father's Love. And I really like the words of this newer song. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away, as wounds which mar the chosen one, the Lord Jesus, bringing many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Now that is rich in mercy. That is great love with which he loved us. And who are the objects again of salvation? They are undeserving sinners with which he loved us. He is in reference to God. Loved, as you can see, is in the past tense here. He's thinking not of God's love generally, but of his love specifically poured out on Calvary. God loved us and he pursued us even when we were dead in trespasses. He unconditionally loved us, he voluntarily loved us, he sacrificially loved us, and he proved it at Calvary. By the way, do you know of anyone who ever loved you like that? I don't. No one but God loves us like that. So what do spiritually dead sinners need? Well, they need to become spiritually alive. They need to be regenerated. They need to be born again. And that's what happens at salvation, verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he's raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now this refers to our union, our identity, the relationship we now have with Jesus Christ because of salvation. Notice, even when we were dead in trespasses, number one, he's made us alive together with Christ. You were spiritually regenerated. And by the way, this is an aorist active indicative. Again, this is referring to a past event in which God made us alive, spiritually. In other words, we were born again, and we were born again because we are now connected with Christ. Number two, by grace you have been saved. As we're going to see that same phrase in verse 8, in fact, in the same verb tenses even. You've been saved. From what? From hell. And, you've been, and he's raised us up together, together with who? With Christ. 
And he's made us sit together with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And all of these are accomplished facts. These are not things to hope for. These are things that have happened. It's like I've illustrated before. Imagine this pen being you and this Bible being Jesus Christ. Before you were saved, you were separated from Christ, spiritually dead, on your way to hell. At salvation, you put your faith in Christ and the Spirit of God placed you into union with Jesus Christ. As far as God is concerned, your history in Adam is over. You are now in Christ. You are a new creation in him. You've died with Christ. You've been buried with Christ. You've been raised with Christ. You've been ascended with Christ. You've been made to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's how God now relates to you. And all on the basis of grace. These are all indicatives. They're not subjunctives, as if it may be true or not. They're not imperatives. They're not commands for you to do anything. They're telling you what God has done. They're not optatives. They're not wishes. They're indicatives. They are facts. This is the way it is, dear friend. You need to understand it and believe it. And by the way, this is why you need to know your Bible. Apart from knowing your Bible, you would not know all of this. These are all realities that God has accomplished for you by his grace, and they're all unfelt but true. You don't feel this. You don't feel it salvation. You know, uh, I just died with Christ. Uh, buried. Uh, risen. Uh, you know. You know, it's not a feeling. Now, you can have a lot of different feelings when you get saved. You might feel very relieved. Now you're going to heaven. But you don't know you're saved by your feelings. It's not like, just a second, it's coming from my feet, it's working its way up. <sighs> I know I'm saved. You know, it's not a feeling. It's believing the facts of the gospel and therefore embracing the provision and promises of God. Wow, what a union, what an identity, what a relationship. Now God sees you. United with his very own son. Wow. But why did God do all of this? Yes, we know he greatly loved us. We know he was rich in mercy to us. We know he saved us by his grace. But to what ultimate end or purpose? What do the scriptures say? Verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of what? There it is again. His grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You see, the eternal purpose of salvation is to put on display the exceeding riches of God's grace in his kindness, his unmerited kindness, his undeserved kindness. That's why we define grace that way. And it was toward us. Notice, in the ages to come, that means the world is not coming to an end soon. I don't care what North Korea does. You know, it's not coming to an end soon. There are ages to come. That in the ages to come, he might show, the word means display, to put on display, the exceeding riches, not just riches of his grace, but exceeding, sur unsurpassing riches. You know, as you think of superlatives like that, I think of ice cream. <laughs> you know, I love ice cream, and it shows. And you know, when I was growing up, you could go to Bridgman's, and you could get a Lollapalooza. You ever have a Lollapalooza? Yeah, some of you know what I'm talking about. You have a Lollapalooza. I mean, that thing was huge. That wasn't just one scoop or two scoops or three. I don't know how many scoops, but it was exceedingly surpassing by way of ice cream. And I loved every minute of it. <laughs> that in the ages to come, he might put on display the exceeding riches of his grace. You know, Samuel Ball in his commentary on Ephesians writes, and I quote, one practice common throughout the ancient pagan world was to dedicate statues and trophies won in battle to the gods. 
Thus, to enter a temple in antiquity, assuming it's not been plundered at some earlier point, was like entering a museum displaying various dedications and spoils of victory from old battles. For example, the Oracle Center in Delphi was filled with treasuries that housed gold and silver objects and various weapons and other spoils of victory. And you see, dear friends, you and I are those trophies of grace. We're going to be put on display to show the exceeding riches of his grace. You know, it kind of reminds me of two angels who were sitting on a bench discussing the grace of God toward man. And one says to the other, don't you think this concept of grace is overplayed and embellished? Is it really that needed and really that impressive? And just at that moment, Randy Zempel and me go walking by. And the angels look at us and then at each other and say, The song is spot on. Wonderful grace of Jesus. You know, you just think of all the folks that are here today that have been saved by the grace of God. You know, they're trophies of grace. You're a trophy of grace. You know, you just think, uh, just looking at the audience, I'll look at Tom Stiegel here for a minute. You know, he was going to a Roman Catholic seminary to become a priest. When he ended up leaving there and coming to UMD, hearing the gospel and getting saved. And now he's a pastor too. You know, I was thinking of Bruce Carey. I saw him here earlier. You know, Bruce really struggled before he was saved with bitterness. And he'll tell you this because he lost one of his twin babies. And he was bitter for years. And you know what? Today he's a trophy of grace, saved by the grace of God. You think of John Moran right here, raised Roman Catholic as well really contended that salvation was by works, but when presented with the truth from the Bible, he yielded to the Bible instead of the church. He was saved by grace. He goes out to hear Pastor Leonard Radke at Beacon Bible Church, and what does he tell him at the door? Father Radke. That was a hell of a message. <laughs> I think I'll go home and have a beer on it. A trophy of God's grace. Amazing grace. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Don't you love the grace of God? But since God is holy and we have sinned and the penalty for sin is death, even though God loved us and doesn't, you might say, doesn't our sin need to be punished even though he loved us? Doesn't the penalty need to be paid? And the answer is yes. And that's why number seven, the reason for salvation by grace is because of Jesus Christ. It's not because of you and me. It's because of his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You see, without Jesus Christ, there would be no payment for sin for us. Without Jesus Christ, there would be no punishment of sin for us. Jesus Christ's death was a sacrificial death. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ's death was a substitutionary death as he died in our place taking our punishment. Jesus Christ's death was a satisfactory death as his death paid for our sins and satisfied God's holy demands. And it's because of Jesus Christ how he died for our sins and arose again, that we could be saved by God's awesome and amazing grace. And that's why this message is called the gospel. How Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Do you know most people have heard the word gospel, but they can't even define it? When they think of gospel, they might think of the whole Bible. Though the whole Bible is not good news, there's bad news. People are going to hell. The good news is that Jesus Christ, on that cross, had you in mind, and he died for your sins. And then, on the third day, he rose again. And they rolled the stone back, not to let him out, but to let people in, to see that he rose from the dead. And because of Jesus Christ, salvation is now available to you and me. 
You know, I looked at a cross every Sunday morning as we said the Apostles' Creed, but I never understood that when he died, he died for me. That he paid for all of my sin. That it is finished. There was nothing left for me to do as I thought salvation was a reward for good people. And good works, not a gift for sinners. Did you know in the visitor center in Salt Lake City, where the Mormon temple is, there was an altar right here, as you can see. And when the guide was asked, what is this? They'll say, well, that's Adam and that's Eve. And there's an altar with fruit on it. And then there's a living lamb next to it. You realize, dear friends, that's exactly what religion teaches? Who offered the fruit? Was it Adam? Was it Eve? No, it was Cain. Cain offered the fruit, and it was rejected. The way God said you come to him is by the death of a lamb, a substitutionary lamb, so that God clothed Adam and Eve with the coats of skin through the death of an innocent animal, as it were. That is the difference between religion and true Christianity, once again, on vivid display in Salt Lake City. But now all of this leads us to the important question, namely, is your salvation forever or can it be lost? Forfeited, given back, or returned? Can you know for sure right now, can you know for sure right now that in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, that you will go to heaven? And that's the eighth thing we see about salvation from this passage. The eternal security of salvation is underscored by the perfect paraphrastic phrase, you have been saved. Now that's found in verse 5 as well, and let me be technical for a minute. The phrase, you have been saved, is a combination of two verbs. And that's why the King James Version says, you are saved. Present tense. The New King James says, you have been saved. Perfect tense. Now why does one translate this present? Why one past? Because you see, it's a combination of a present tense verb, and then on top of it, a perfect tense verb. So it's communicating, you have, and you are, and in essence, you will always be saved through faith that you placed in Christ when you were saved. For by grace, you have and you continue to be, and you will always be, as it were, saved. You know, how would they communicate something that was permanent? Well, this is one of the ways they would do it. You see, if you could lose your salvation, you would have to do something to keep it. If you have to do something to keep your salvation, salvation then depends on you and your works and your faithfulness, then it's no longer by grace. Do you really believe that God's grace can save you, but for some reason won't keep you? Don't you receive eternal life at salvation, and by its very definition, it must go on forever? Isn't a spiritual birth a one-time event? So if you could lose your salvation, you'd have to be born again and again, and maybe again and again and again, but not so. You know, I was talking to someone just recently about this very issue of the gospel and these truths that we were looking at here, and in doing so, he was fighting this. He was not accepting this. Uh, we had a very good conversation, but he told me in his background that he, though he had raised Southern Baptist and such, that he uh, later became a, a wino on First Street here for a few years, until he finally kind of cleaned up his life. He's been sober now for 40-some years, and so forth. But in the course of the conversation, he said that his parents did not talk to them, him for five years. And I said, that's exactly my point. During those five years, were you still their child? Yes. But you weren't having fellowship with them. And you see, when believers sin against the Lord, they remain a child of God, but they lose fellowship with God. But how do you undo a spiritual birth? How do you lose eternal life? How do you stop being a child of God? 
That's why Jesus said, I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. And that is why, principle number nine, the absolute assurance of salvation is highlighted by the indicative mood of you have been saved. You see, that phrase right there, you have been saved, is in the indicative mood. In other words, it's a fact. It's a done deal. You have been saved. Does it sound iffy or not? <laughs> it sounds for certain. You see, God wants every believer at the very point of faith in Christ to know they're saved and to know they're saved forever. So, so why don't Christians have the absolute assurance of their salvation? Well, I can tell you reason number one is many of them are not truly saved. They're Christians by heritage, or they were baptized as a baby, or they go to a Christian church, but they've never understood the gospel. If I could illustrate it down here with these chairs. Before I was saved, again, I had faith in Jesus Christ, and I had faith in my works, in my church, in my rituals, and I was not saved. I wasn't saved until I put my faith in Christ alone, and then I knew for sure I was going to heaven because it didn't depend on me. It depended on what Christ had done for me and what God now promises to me. You see, many, quote, Christians are not, they don't know for sure they're saved because they're not really saved yet. They're still trusting in their works. But in some cases, they're saved, and they're going by their feelings instead of the facts of God's word. Or they're seeking assurance by their walk and their works and their fruit instead of Christ's completed work. You know, when people say, if you're truly saved, you're going to have ongoing faithfulness and fruitfulness in your life, what a great way to either create self-righteousness or a lack of assurance. If you start looking at your walk, how good a walk do you have to have? How much fruit do you really need? And now, instead of focusing on Christ, you focus on your walk. You see, justification is based on Christ's work for you. Sanctification involves Christ's work in you. Let's not confuse the two. Sometimes people, due to prolonged carnality, begin to wonder, am I really saved or not? Or maybe they think they need to know the exact date and time. You don't. Though there was a time you weren't saved, there was a time when you heard the gospel, and there was a time when you knew you were saved forever. You see, as I'm going back to Randy here, that was one of the issues he struggled with in light of his Lutheran background. If you ever listened to his testimony, he didn't have a testimony. There was no past. There was no time he understood the gospel and believed it for himself. There was just this ongoing, well, I was baptized, and then I was confirmed, and I was this, and I was that, and I believe that too. It was like an ongoing thing. And you see, dear friends, there was a time I was lost. There's a time I heard the gospel. There's a time I believed in it. And there's a time, therefore, I know I'm saved. Now, you don't have to know the exact date, but you do need to know you were lost, and you do need to know the gospel, and your faith needs to be in Christ alone. And that's why when we're doing missionary work around the world and we're giving out the gospel, these people are always confused. And I don't know if they were saved before or after. All I know is many of them after they heard the clear teaching of Romans tell me they know for sure they're saved forever. And that's what's important. See, God wants you to have that assurance. You say, but isn't there a human condition or requirement for salvation? By the way, there is no greater question than what the Philippian jailer asked. What must I do to be saved? And the answer was... Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And that is why here in verse 8 we see the human condition of salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith in who? The end of verse 7, Jesus Christ. The word faith is the word pistis. Its verb form is pistuo. It means to believe about or to rely on or to trust in. By its very nature, it is a transitive verb, which needs, means it needs a subject and it needs an object. Someone to do the believing, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Those who deny eternal security or who believe in the 
the guaranteed perseverance of the elect turn faith into ongoing faithfulness and undermine assurance. Look at Ephesians 1, just turn back a page or maybe across, verses 12 and 13. And notice what it says. That we who first trusted in Christ, that's the issue should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, having believed, having believed in him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. They heard the gospel, they believed the gospel, they were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Dear friends, regeneration does not precede faith. It clearly follows faith as set forth in this verse. You see, the only condition and requirement for justification before God is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is not a work. Sometimes people say, well, isn't believing a work? No, it's not. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace. They're counted as debt. God owes you something based on your works. But in contrast to him who does not work, but what does he do? He believes. He doesn't work, but he believes, which means faith is not a work. Faith takes God at his word. Faith trusts in the work of another, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for your sins and rose again. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies, who the ungodly, his faith. Notice, not God's gift of faith to you, but his faith is accounted for righteousness. You see, if you take the view that total depravity means you're even unable to believe, what that would mean is that people ultimately go to hell because of their unbelief, but since God never gave them the gift of faith, God holds them responsible for their unbelief, though he didn't give them the gift, so-called. That doesn't make any sense. What kind of God is that? That will condemn you to hell forever because of unbelief, but supposedly has to give you this gift of faith to believe. He has to regenerate you a split second before you believe. And that isn't true. And that is why what ultimately condemns a person, John 3, 18, is he that believes in him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed. He's never believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. God holds everyone responsible for their willingness to respond by faith to the truth they have. So while our sins make us deserving of hell, our sins don't ultimately condemn us. Our unbelief does. We're not condemned due to a lack of election. We're condemned due to a lack of faith in Jesus Christ. We're not condemned due to a lack of water baptism as an infant or as an adult. We're condemned because we did not believe. And by the way, that's why at the point of death, babies who have not reached an age where they could either believe or not believe go to heaven. Because Jesus died for their sins and rose again, and they have not had the capacity to believe in that personally. And that's why when David's baby died, he said, that baby will not come back to me, but I'm going to go to be with that baby. And he was comforted, and he comforted Bathsheba in light of that. That's what the Bible teaches. So what is the direction of this so great salvation? Where does it originate from? Verse 8 tells us again. The origination of salvation is that not of yourselves. Not of your now, by the way, the word that here cannot refer to faith. Some will say, and that faith is not of yourself. It cannot refer to it grammatically. It must refer to you have been saved. And that salvation is not of yourself. That salvation is the gift of God. By the way, nowhere in the Bible is the faith associated with salvation called a gift. The gift is always salvation or eternal life or the Holy Spirit. It's not of yourself. And salvation does not come from you. The direction of salvation is not from God, 
excuse me, you to God, but it's always from God to you. And that is why I said before, and I repeat again, that you can always tell a true gospel from a false gospel. The question is, where's the flashlight? See, the true gospel puts the flashlight here. Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again. Put your faith in him. The false gospel may mention that, but then turns the flashlight on you. You have to do something. No, it's not of yourselves. You need to give your life to Christ. If that was true, it would be from here to there. No, 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 no. Salvation is because Christ gave his life for you. You have to repent from your sins. Oh, no, you don't. Even though you have to come to grips with the fact that you're lost. No, no, no. You believe that he died for your sins. Just the opposite. The opposite. Now, repentance from sin may be the byproduct of being saved. We saw that last Wednesday night when it came to the life of Zacchaeus. But let's not confuse the two. Salvation by grace is not something man does for God. It's something God does for man because of his great love, his rich mercy, his amazing grace, his incredible sacrifice. Thus, number 12, the source of salvation is that it is the gift of God. It's the gift of God. Salvation, again, is not a reward for good people or good works. It's an amazing gift of God's grace for hopeless, helpless, hellbound sinners. But like with any gift, it must be received for it to become yours. Because you can reject this gift. So the Bible is very clear. For the wages of sin is death, separation. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice the gift is what? It's eternal life. Now, verse 9 goes on to clarify the truth of verse 8 by way of contrast. And therefore, the clarification regarding that is not of works, lest anyone should boast. Salvation is not of works. Now, keep in mind, people do not rely on their bad works to get them to heaven. They rely on their good works. And the flesh just wants to do something, anything. What kind of works do people do to, or perform with hope that it will help them to go to heaven or be saved or get their good to outweigh their bad? Well, we've already seen the only response to the gospel is not a work. It is faith in Jesus Christ alone. Not of works lest anyone should boast. Not by water baptism, lest anyone should boast. Not by church attendance, lest anyone should boast. Not by my commitment to Christ, lest anyone should boast. Not by my trying to be holy, or trying to keep the Ten Commandments, or tithing, or not sinning, or confessing my sins, lest anyone should boast. Not by my faithfulness to Christ, or praying the sinner's prayer, or asking Jesus into my heart, lest anyone should boast. Now some don't perceive this as works, but these things are all works. And you see, perception needs to come in touch with reality. See, Wednesday night I noticed, and I noticed it today here, there's a smell coming from these plants right here. It smells like broccoli. <laughs> you know, I thought someone was passing gas Wednesday night when I heard it. I thought, wow, that's really bad. <laughs> Upset stomach, you know? Only to find, no, 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 no. See, my perception was wrong. And people's perceptions are wrong when it comes to salvation as well. And that's why, if all of this is true, and it is, then the deterrent in salvation by God's grace is lest anyone should boast. There's no room for boasting in God's plan of grace. True, but truly being saved by God's grace is very humbling. You have to admit your works cannot save you, that they're, they're like filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6, lest anyone should boast. You have to admit perhaps you were duped by your religion, lest anyone should boast. You have to admit you are wrong in your past beliefs, lest anyone should boast. 
You have to admit maybe your church or your traditions that you grew up with were wrong, lest anyone should boast. It's like the old song says, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to your cross I cling. Samuel Ball, again, and I quote him, says, One can boast in the Lord, but not before him. This connects directly to those in uh, Greco-Roman Ephesus, where the buildings were replete with notices or boasts of the lavish deeds of various benefactors. In Paul's Ephesus, one of the most impressive examples of such a benefaction was a grand archway entrance to the central market funded by two imperial freedmen of Augustus named Mazius and Mithidrates. You see, they put their names right on that arch so they could boast in what they did. And you see, dear friends, there will be no one in heaven peacocking, boasting. See my name in the marquee? See what I've done? I'm in heaven because I repented of all my sin. No. I'm in heaven because I was faithful to Jesus Christ. No. I'm in heaven because I was Catholic or Lutheran or Assemblies of God or Duluth Bible Church or whatever that is. No. I'm in heaven because I was a pastor or a deacon or a Sunday school teacher. No. No. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That's why he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And as a result, did you realize the incredible blessings of salvation involve having been blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ? That's what Paul wrote earlier in chapter 1, verse 3, that you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, and there's that wonderful phrase again, in Christ. But did you realize that while you were saved individually at the point of time in which you placed your faith in Christ alone, yet you then became part of the family of God, of the church of Jesus Christ corporately? So look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now notice, we is plural. His workmanship is singular. This is referring to what Paul will develop later in chapter 2 and 3, how Jews and Gentiles have become one in the body of Christ. One in the church of Jesus Christ. You see, there's not only an individual result, you're saved, but there's this corporate result. You become part of the church. You become part of the body of Christ. God's masterpiece, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. So if salvation is by God's grace, if salvation is a gift from God, if salvation is received by simple faith in Christ alone, if salvation is not of yourself and not of your works, where do good works fit in? As God doesn't want us to live lives of sin, but lives of gratitude for his grace that honor and glorify him. Well, verse 10 tells us, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The desired objective of salvation is for good works. Not to be saved, but because we are. Not in order to stay saved, but because we are. And now we are a new creation in Christ. God has saved us for a purpose. That we should walk in them. Not guaranteed will, but should. Should believers be filled with good works? Yes, but do they always? No. Should believers live lives that bring honor and glory to the Lord? Yes, but do they always? No. Should believers abuse and misuse the grace of God into a license of sin? Never. But at times, do they? Yes. Should the love of Christ compel us to now live for him who died for us? Absolutely. It should. 
But unfortunately, it doesn't always. And that's why as you think of the proper place of good works, through faith in Christ, you are saved by the grace of God. As you learn to now walk by faith in the power of the Spirit, responding to the Word of God, the byproduct of that will be good works. As you learn to abide in Christ, He will produce fruit in your life. And that is the proper place of good works. Religion, again, puts the cart before the horse. Oops. <laughs> that was to keep you awake. So, how does all of this apply to you? If you are a new believer in Jesus Christ, this should emphasize, I need to know my Bible. I need to understand more of these riches in Christ. I need to understand my position, my possessions, and my privileges in Christ. And you know, new believer, all of what we covered is true of you already. Wow. Can you stand amazed at this great? What about if you're a growing believer in Christ? Keep on growing. Because you see, the moment you're saved, you're complete in Christ. You're just like a baby that came out of the womb. You've got all the equipment. All the pieces are there. You've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Now you need to grow. And in growing, you then need to learn to walk with the Lord so that you can grow and live a life that honors God. But if you're here today and you're a carnal believer and you've been thwarting the will of God in your life, you've been doing your own thing, I can already tell you something. You're miserable. You're fighting the Lord and you're miserable. And that can change when you just admit, I'm wrong, Lord, and start to enjoy this lavish grace. Start to enjoy this unbelievable love, claiming his forgiveness, knowing you can walk in fellowship with him now. And he has a plan of good works for your life. But if you're here today and you are a lost sinner in need of salvation, you've heard it. You've heard the message. God wants to save you by his grace. Through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That salvation is not of yourselves. That salvation is the gift of God. And that salvation is not of works. Thus, the glory all goes to Jesus Christ. Will you believe it for yourself? And you can therefore have it for yourself. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your wonderful word and for the truth of grace and your deep love for us. Wow. These verses were pregnant with meaning. And as we unpack them today, and looked at word after word and phrase after phrase. What a great salvation we have. Indeed, may we never boast in ourselves, but glory in you. And glory in your Son. May we say like Paul, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So thank you for this, dear Father. And I pray that you would address the needs of everyone here. Someone's here who's not yet saved. May they transfer their faith from those things that could not save them and trust in Christ alone. If they're saved and they've wondered about the security of their salvation, I pray that they would see today that when you save, you keep us saved so that we can be assured, regardless of how we feel and regardless of how faithful our walk, that we can know even at the moment of salvation that we're saved and we're saved forever. I pray that we could be growing believers. If there are believers here today who are just bucking you, they're just walking in carnality, they're just fighting your plan or your will, I pray you would humble them by your amazing grace. For we see once again that you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. And the humble are those who admit they need you and they're willing to trust you to provide. Thank you again for a copy of the Word of God that says this so plainly. Thank you again for the great God that you are and for your Son, our Savior, our Lord, our life, our hope, and the one who's coming again, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray.